Good afternoon. I'm Steve Basnick, and along with Aaron Marsden, I would like to welcome everyone on behalf of Canasa and Security Canada to our weekly online learning session. While many are stuck at home, we thought this would be a good time to deliver some product and service knowledge that will be beneficial when we're all back to work. I would like to say a special thank you to HID Global for their support and sponsoring today's session. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Valerie Michetti, Dan Chevery, and Luke Meridio. Luke has over 20 years of experience working for OEMs in the fire and security space, including five with HID Global. His current role for HID, Director of PAX Product Marketing, blends inbound and outbound marketing activities with both tactical and strategic initiatives in his region, the Americas. Val is the Regional Account Manager for HID in Western Canada and the Pacific Northwest, with 13 years of experience in the physical security market. Entrenched in access control methodology, Val focuses on customer security with an emphasis on bridging the gap between current and next generation technologies. Dan manages Eastern Canada on behalf of HID, covering Ontario, Quebec, and the Atlantic. Dan sees physical security as an industry that is facing a paradigm shift, a new way of leveraging modern technologies, empowering how we use access control and significantly improving security since the 90s to ensure end users are future ready. Now that I've passed my test there, I hopefully read that all correctly. I'll let you know to please feel free to type your questions in the bottom at the Q&A window there. And at the end of the session, we'll take questions roughly 20 minutes from now. I'll now turn the session over to Val, Dan, and Luke. Welcome and thanks for being here. Thank you, Steve. And thank you all for taking your time out of your busy schedules today for this presentation. I'm Val Michetti. I'm Dan Chevry. And we cover Canada from coast to coast for HID Global. Our contact information will be up again at the end of the presentation, so please take note of it if you don't have it. On today's agenda, I'll first go through some research and data on the state of the access control industry that we gathered from some surveys we did. I'll then touch on the impact of these findings and to help determine how to prioritize the solutions. Dan will then loop back in to discuss how to upgrade your systems to stay ahead of the curve and to ensure that your environments are safe and secure. Whether your projects are big or small, if you're a multinational customer or a single location, we'll help you find the right path to follow to roll out a successful upgrade plan that meets your needs for the future. We compiled these surveys in late 2019 as well as in 2017. These two surveys have led to the findings we'll cover today. Infrastructure from a PACS point of view is aging and confidence in the performance of the security of those systems is beginning to wear away. The 2017 versus 2019 data shows that people are increasingly finding that their physical access control systems do not meet or exceed their requirements. There was a 17% jump in people who find that their physical access control system only meets the essential requirements. And we can assume that that number will continue to grow going forward. When looking at the current age of these customer systems, we discovered that the majority of components, be it software, controllers, credentials, or readers are all three to six plus years old. And yet surprisingly, only about 50% of respondents said they plan to upgrade their obsolete systems in the next 12 months. So why is that? The biggest hurdles to upgrading are cost, budget, and ROI. People are reporting that they simply aren't seeing a return on investment. So how do you justify the cost? How do you ensure you're able to build value behind the business case to upgrade your access control system? Dan will cover that in just a little bit. The good news year over year from 2018 to 2019 is that there's a roughly 9% increase in the use of more secure credential technology. That means people are moving away from PROX and other outdated unsecure technologies and moving towards CIOS, iClass SE, mobile credentials, and other secure credential technologies. Within the survey, we presented a full list of technologies and asked respondents what they currently use. These numbers will add up to more than 100% because some companies are using multiple technologies, for example, CIOS and PROX during a migration. 
45% of organizations are currently using iClass. 20% are on a high frequency such as CIOS or MyFair DevFire and FIPS 201. 51% of respondents that said that they're actually using 125 kilohertz low frequency procs, which is a 30 year old technology and full of security vulnerabilities. 26% are still using MagStripe and a surprising 17% use barcodes, which is even older and less secure. As you can see, there are a lot of opportunities for upgrades for these clients who are still using these outdated technologies. You might be wondering, how ready are people to implement mobile access? About 54% of respondents have already introduced mobile or will be doing so in the next one to three years. Many are starting out by upgrading the readers over a long-term migration plan and will introduce the mobile credentials once fully upgraded. Adoption continues to rise with 25% being fully deployed, partially deployed, or in the process of deploying a mobile solution. Another 6% will deploy mobile enabled readers in the next year. So what are the impacts of these findings? There are many components to discuss within an access control deployment from card reader to card to controller to door hardware and finally the software. Today, we're going to focus just on the vulnerabilities between the card and the reader. Here's a list of the credential technologies that were being supported by the survey respondents. A security director may support procs, MagStripe and CIOS across the organization she manages, and not just a single technology type. What this data shows us is that 54% of organizations use at least one or more secure technologies in their current deployments. I'm sure that most, if not all of you, know the vulnerabilities of low frequency technologies. They're easy to clone either yourself by buying one of these cloners off eBay or Amazon, or through any one of these local sites or companies in your area, for example, FOB Coover, FOB Toronto, small independent companies in every city across the country. And in the US, they even have card copying machines that you can find in big box stores like Bed Bath & Beyond. What about card vulnerabilities? When possible, you should use custom keys. It's much like a password where you wouldn't leave your default password as welcome one or admin. Custom keys rather than standard or default keys are a great place to start. There are many other ways to conceal the card information, such as not having the card numbers printed on the card itself or having a mismatched number printed. You should also ensure that you're using a tracked format, such as Corporate 1000. Open non-tracked formats, such as H30, H10301 26-bit, leave you open to vulnerabilities as these types of formats can have the same card numbers created over and over again. A tracked format ensures no duplications will ever exist. Finally, allowing unencrypted communication to your panel, Wigan protocol, opens you up to having the card information seized very easily by using a simple hacking device. OSDP is the most secure way to go if you have that option with the access control system you're using. Let's now discuss the opportunities for migration and how to prioritize the solution. Having a secure technology deployed is foundational. Here are all the different questions you should ask yourself about your current or future systems. Are you using Wigand or OSDP communication? Do you still have low frequency activated on a multi-technology reader when your migration is complete, leaving the option open for someone to program a low frequency card into the system and then clone it? Are you using a tracked format? Remember, no 26-bit or other untracked formats. Privacy, are you showing that card number on the card? Is there an SIO, a secure identity object on the card? This will provide layered security. Are you using public keys or custom keys? So how do mobile credentials come into play? For starters, let's just look at the convenience aspect. Having a phone instead of a card to unlock the door is convenient. Most people carry their phones with them at all times. But how often have you left for work without your card and kept going anyway and just asked for a spare card when you got there? Had you forgotten your phone, you would have gone back for it. When you walk around the office, you would probably leave your card on your desk, but you wouldn't leave your phone on your desk. 
we've made physical access administration easier with a digital online process. It's quicker to issue a mobile credential to someone than to create a card, possibly print the person's ID or the company logo onto it and have them meet you to pick up the card. With the mobile credential, you push it down to the person via email and they can have it loaded and ready to use within seconds. And that photo ID and logo can be loaded straight into the person's phone app for verification. There's no more need for keeping stacks of spare cards for visitors who may not give the cards back when they leave, for employees who forgot their cards at home, for people who wanna have extras because they're prone to losing them. With HID's mobile credentials, you simply issue one to the person and then can send up, up to four more to that same person, person for their additional devices. Do you have a work phone, a personal phone, a smartwatch, or a tablet that you also want to store it on? That's one license, five devices. So how do we go about doing these migrations and what equipment should we use? We've come a long way since the floppy disk, the original Mac computers and the Nokia bar phones, as our credential technologies have as well. 125 kilohertz PROX was introduced in the early 90s as a contactless experience and access control. And at the time, a leading technology innovation for users needing control security access in and out of secure areas. PROC transmits standard zeros and ones and is not protected by any encryption as to ensure your client's PACS configurations are secure and not left open for card cloning. As to what Val alluded to earlier, Shortly after in the late 90s, early 2000s, a more sophisticated contactless technology was released by HID called iClass. This leveraged 13.5 megahertz frequencies and more storage capacity within the card for other multi-application uses. However, let's note that just because the credential frequency is 13.56 kilohertz does not mean that it is secure. Fast forward a bit more to 2011, iClass had become compromised as did PROX with the introduction of iClass, and iClass SE was introduced by HID using a protection layer called SIO, Secure Identity Object, a wrapper of encryption to protect the payload data stored within the card. To date, iClass SE is still secure, more secure above PROX and iClass Legacy. In 2014, our latest card technology was released, CIOS. CIOS is a software-based security platform non-dependent to the chip within the physical card. Since CIOS is software-based, it's versatile, and it's able to be used in physical card form or other digital forms of security credentials or third-party applications. CIOS combines the power of HID's SIO and additional cryptographic encryption layers beyond that to protect the information inside. CIOS enables users to store additional downstream application files on the card, secure print, other access control buildings, parking, time and attendance, or biometric data in a single card. CIOS is how HID has chosen to power their mobile credentials and the security foundation for its partnerships with external third-party technology platforms or devices. Example, physical biometric cards, smartwatches, credential bracelets, and more. Before we forget, did we mention that CIOS credentials are not only our most secure, but they are our lowest cost credential as well. More the reason to start to migrate away from Prox and start to talk to your clients about HID CIOS. Credential technology has evolved and come a long way as our reader technology has. Let's look at that next. For those of you who haven't seen this, HID Signo is the new reader platform that was introduced to the world in 2020. As you can see, we've made some huge changes to the look and design of the readers. They come in a sleek new form factor with the mullion readers being the same height as the single gang readers and come standard with a silver trim plate. We've also added a keypad option on our mullion reader, giving you the flexibility to pick any of the form factors that you want. Here are a few of the key improvements in our signal reader lineup. For starters, the option for OSDP V1 or V2 is supported out of the box so that you can move away from WIGAND and towards a secure bi-directional communication. The keypad no longer has physical buttons, but rather is capacitive. The backlit LED colors in the keypad can also be adjusted to match the color of the LED status bar. The automatic surface detection that comes native to this reader will be able to detect the type of surface it's installed on and auto-calibrate to give you the best read range possible. 
Whether it's a metal door frame or a standard wall mount, the automatic surface detection feature improves the user experience with limited intervention of the reader itself. And speaking of read range, this reader will provide a better read range than you're used to seeing on the iClass SE readers. All readers come with Bluetooth and NFC near field communication support by default. Maybe best of all, these readers are by far and largely more cost effective than our existing iClass lineup. With all these advantages, Signal is definitely the right choice. We hope you'll dig deeper into Signal after our session here today. It truly is a game changer for the packed industry and clients alike. With the launch of Signal, we've tried to make the ordering process simpler for you. We now have four profiles with far fewer pricing options per model. The first three listed here are available today and the custom profile readers will be available within the next few months. The Signal standard profile includes a low frequency. When comparing to our iClass SE readers, this would be much like a multi-class reader, which has prox support. Let's point out that the Signal reader has the ability to read in DALA 125 kilohertz. This is a next step in multi-technology readers at HIB, giving Indala customers the ability to advance their credential workforce by introducing HID mobile credentials, upgrade from weekend to OSDP, and maintain Indala while migrating over to a more secure and recent credential, a first of its kind in the physical security industry. Any changes you want to make to these readers can be done via Bluetooth using the HID Reader Manager app. So Dan just mentioned the Reader Manager app. Let's take a look at how it can be useful for you. If you've ever used a config card, you'll be very pleased using this app instead. You can make all sorts of configuration changes to your readers in the field by simply connecting to your mobile ready or mobile enabled reader via Bluetooth. This app can be used today on any iClass SE reader with the BLE module in it and all signal readers. When you first launch the app, you'll have a list of all nearby readers pop up. You can select the reader you want to modify and then if you want to, you can rename the reader so it's easier to locate the next time. The next page will bring you to the high level inspection report showing you things like firmware information and if a new release is available, as well as the hardware configuration of your reader. At this point, if you want to go further and actually make some configuration changes to the reader, you'll either need to power cycle your reader in the case of a mobile ready reader, or in the case of a mobile enabled reader, you will have been provided authorization from the end user ahead of time to be able to make changes without power cycling. The third screenshot here shows you the list of settings you can alter, including disabling credential types, adjusting Bluetooth ranges, changing LED colors, switching from Wigan to OSDP, and changing keypad settings. The fourth screenshot is the area where you can turn on or off tap or twist and go and adjust the ranges. These adjustments are made on a reader by reader basis by connecting to each one individually. If you'll be making the same adjustments to multiple readers, you can save all these changes to a template and then simply apply the saved template to each reader once you connect, which will save you a lot of time. As you can see from the screenshot on the far right, you can disable Prox or Legacy iClass on or any of the credential types that you aren't using so that they won't even be read, which will increase the security even more. So I just mentioned a moment ago that the mobile enabled readers are handled differently than the mobile ready readers. Mobile enabled readers are fully personalized readers with the end users custom mobile keys and organization ID programmed into them. There's a higher level of security on mobile enabled readers. And in the case of using the reader manager app, it requires the end user to authorize the technician to have access to their readers. The end user can have this authorization period be for a specific period of time only, for example, eight hours, two months, one year, or permanently. They would just log into the reader manager portal, add in the technician and the authorized time period. The technician would then receive an email invitation, which they'd open up in the reader manager app to load that key. They're then all set to be able to make changes to all the readers for that particular customer without having to power cycle. I hope that many of you listening today have already heard of the Reader Manager app or even used it and are getting comfortable with it. The Signal readers do not support config cards since they all come standard with Bluetooth capability. So this will be the tool you'll need to make all configuration changes on Signal readers going forward. Now that you know more about our Signal lineup 
and have a better grasp on which reader profile you should choose for your next new installation or migration plan, let's explore different upgrade options you have. In many cases, it is best practice to establish a standard of a multi-technology credentials to accelerate the migration. All multi-tech cards are issued at the outset and the readers are replaced over time as the budget and schedule per permit. These cards will continue to work on both the old and the new readers as they get swapped out. In these cases, a Signal Smart or CIOS profile reader would be the better choice as they only support high frequency technologies. However, there are many occasions where single technology cards are beneficial to reduce costs in cases where you have a higher number of cardholders. A Signal Standard Profile Reader supports low frequency technologies, allowing you to move towards secure standards at a pace that works for you and your client. Once all the new multi-technology readers are installed, you can then issue out new high frequency cards to everyone and go back and disable the procs in the reader. If you aren't sure which option is better suited for you, reach out to Valerie and we'd be happy to give you a hand with that. I hope that some of the important takeaways from today's presentations ha presentation have stuck with you, including selecting a more secure credential technology, making a plan to get rid of those prox cards and transition away from purchasing more, select card forming and customization that's secure and tracked, and lastly, plan for the future by including Bluetooth and NFC in your migrations. Thanks, Dan. We've now reached the end of the presentation. Let's take a look at answering some of your questions. All right, we've got a great one here. With the pandemic requiring more and more contactless options, what other two-factor credential authentication method will HID provide since clients may be less open to a touch keypad? I'm going to pass this one off to Luke Meridu, please, for answering. Thank you, Val. Appreciate it. Um, so this is, this is a good question. We're getting asked a lot about uh, multi-factor modalities and, and you know, what, what are the preferred methodologies. Uh, I, I'd argue that contactless is, is obviously the, the driving force for most of the, the decisions that are being made around access right now in the context of COVID versus MFA, which is, which is a, you know, obviously going to be a subset of all doors. Um, facial recognition, of course, is getting a lot of press. And while we don't have a solution, we recognize its importance. Um, and in a multimodal environment, you know, facial recognition is certainly attractive, but it is very complicated and expensive and has challenges. You know, the, the, any biometric modality that you look at will have something different than the near 100% performance of an RFID credential, for example. So you have a false accept rate and a false reject rate that is non-zero. So that's you know true of face, it's true of finger, it's true of, of, of you know vein or, or gate or any of these you know interesting, exciting technologies. So you know I think it's going to be very much down to the use case of the individual uh, being you know the individual requirements at the at the client site or at your your site. Um, you know we don't, we don't, there's not a one size fits all. By, by any stretch of the imagination, but the pros and cons and, and overall investment have to be considered. Uh, mobile is certainly a very powerful tool in terms of, of propagating uh, an overall contactless experience. So, you know, one of the things that we that, that Val touched on in terms of mo mobile is, you know, things like remote issuance, you know, not having to touch, you know, a, a counter when you go to get a, your, your picture taken or your uh, get your badge issued. So there's, there are many, many attributes of mobile which, which allow you to get into, uh, into a contactless environment. Thanks, Luke. Um, we have another question here about how the HID readers are powered. Are they battery or wired? So the readers are wired. Okay, let's see. We've got a question here about corporate 1000 and how that works. So if um, you haven't dealt with corporate 1000 before, as I mentioned earlier, this is a tracked format. So um, it's what's different about it than another tracked format is that this is completely controlled by the end user. So each end user would have their own corporate 1000 format that belongs to them, is controlled by them, and they have the ability 
to determine and decide which uh, integrators to work with, which companies can buy on their behalf, and then as well as internally, which employees in their own organization can make changes and request um, different, different changes to be made to their format. So it's completely tracked. So, so again, you don't need to keep track of what your previous card order was. This makes it easier for you as well as the integrator, um, keeps it more secure. So you don't need to know what the last card order was, what number they ended at, what the next number is that they would need to order. You would simply put in a request asking for the next number up, next available card number. And that's the same that goes with all tracked formats. You never need to keep track of the card number. With Corporate 1000, you just have a little bit more uh, control over who purchases, who can, who can't make changes. Okay, so we don't have any more questions at this time. So thank you all for the time you've given us today. If you have any questions for me or Dan, just reach out to us directly. You have our contact information right here. And uh, over to you, Steve. Thanks, Bill. Okay, that brings us to the end of today's session. Thank you for joining us. And once again, thank you to Val, Dan, and Luke, and to HID Global for their support. At the close of this session, a link to register for next week's session will pop up. Please be sure to register. We look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, be well.